I would like to um, ask all panelists, or invite all panelists to enter the stage, please, so that we can start. Perfect. Okay, so we can. Uh, oh, could you perhaps move a bit closer? <laughs> Thank you. So this is a cooperative space here. Um, I would like to start with Sir Vincent Zimmer and to pose you a question, or at least, would you could you tell us a bit about uh, your current project, please? Is the microphone on? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, hello. Uh, thanks for inviting us. The invitation was uh, given to us like four months ago when we were at the really beginning of our project. And also we recently changed our name, so I'll just clarify this. We are now Chiron University. And what we do is we put MOOCs that have been around for a long time and are provided by platforms like edX or the Hassel Plattner Institute and turn them into degree programs for refugees by partnering with traditional universities basically in Germany. Um, the system consists of uh, two years that are completed online and the third year is completed at the partner university. And why are we doing this? Um, we're facing a refugee crisis right now in Europe. Uh, the numbers are skyrocketing, so the official numbers is 800,000. Uh, we have very well, uh, we have very good connections to the refugee camps and to the border countries and we estimate it's more than one million that is coming. Around under this 1 million, at least in Germany, we estimate that there are going to be 100,000 people who have been able to study, have started their education already, or have completed their education before. And what we say, there is a lot of problems related to the refugee crisis, but there's also a chance. A chance that these people can solve all problems we have here in Germany and in all industrial countries regarding demographic development, regarding our education systems, regarding our social systems, and they can also help us uh, to get the economic power and the financial resources behind to integrate the rest of the refugees coming. The reason why we do it and the reason why we're using the advantages of digitalization and of MOOCs, for example, is because these people face four problems. They, have, they lack financial resources, they lack the legal status in the beginning when they arrive, uh, they lack the legal documents because they have often no documents at all, and they have cultural ba uh, barriers, they have language barriers, and they are not located in a in one location, like they move around, they arrive in mm -hmm. Italy, they're heading to Sweden, but they're stuck in Germany, they send away and they end up in Norway, for example. This is a, a journey that is um, not so uncommon. And by giving them education online, they can access their content from everywhere, they can make pause, they can make breaks, they can use all the advantages other people have already elaborated on today. And yes, I'm very happy for the invitation and yeah, happy to, to be on this panel. Thank right. you very Would much. You please, uh perhaps uh, sum up your main experiences with that project, if there are any. There's, there's, I think there's one experience that, is, that I'm really grateful, and I think everyone is, that the whole civil society, and especially the community of uh, the University of Higher Education, is extremely supportive. I worked mm -hmm. in a presidium of Göttingen University before, and so I know a bit about the processes and the university is a really big organization, you know, often universities are shown as advertised as very slow and backward thinking, but they're not, they're just big. And there's just a lot of people to, mm -hmm. you have to move. And when we approached with our project, uh, the presidents, the deans, the professors, uh, they were very, very supportive and very, very fast. And you could see if you can make the point that you actually want to, don't want to do something for yourself, you don't want to sell anything, you just want to use, the advantages of higher education. People see that and believe that, and they're very, very supportive. And I, see, I think that's something we're seeing in overall in civil society today, but especially in the field of higher education. Mm -hmm. Thank you, it's great to hear that. Um, I hate to do it, but I, I think we should move to another topic. I could dwell on that, uh, I think, for hours. Um, yes, but we had, um, we had some very interesting talks and debates about learning spaces, educational spaces, um, about uh, yeah, yeah, space where people uh, share their uh, competencies and, and their knowledge and learn together. So why is it, why is it so difficult uh, to change to this 
kind of en environment in our uh, educational system in Europe. Why is that? Anyone, anybody an answer for that? Because uh, we're working with human beings. And as uh, Richard said up front, uh, no human being change overnight and neither do professors, neither do policy makers <laughs> or anybody else. Mm -hmm. So it takes time. So what we see is, of course, a combination of radical change and incremental change. I, I don't think it's surprising at all that uh, educational systems whatever school or university, changed very slowly. They were built to last, just like the Catholic Church, and Switzerland, by the way, where I've lived 12 years. It's built to change very slowly. And perhaps, radically thinking, that is a good thing. Perhaps it is, because it will encourage others to kind of do more radical mm -hmm. innovations on mm -hmm. the sides and on the fringes. Mm -hmm. But of course, things are changing, but they are naturally changing slowly. Education is also a very traditional business. Mm. It's, it's taken a long time to build, and there's a lot of tradition, and there are a lot of power issues involved as well. So it doesn't, there are uh, forces that keep that going. That Just old. like the Catholic Church, for instance. Just like the Catholic Church, yes. or some other church <laughs> yes. as well. A, yes, and that's a, a word, a notion, uh, which um, parents are really scared of, reform. Because they had lots of reforms, uh, which in the end uh, did not reach that goal, where we had, what we are talking about today. But reform is every day's business. And there's also a lot of passion in education. We all mm -hmm. are experts in education mm -hmm. because we've gone through the education system. And we have very fond memories of our own schools and our own uh, growing up. And, or, you know, at least we think that's, that's the way. At least emotional. Emotions, <laughs> at least. So when we start proposing something new in education, there's all, always this slash back to my own experience. How does this now fit to my experience? Mm -hmm. And uh, memories tend to have silver linings. Uh, many times it, it, you remember it was nicer than it actually was. And <laughs> it's an establishment. Mm. Don't change it too hastily. Mm -hmm. So I want to push back a little on the question because Implied in the question is that we've got an old model and we need a new model, but that there's a model. Mm. I think it makes more sense to think about education as an ecosystem, because we know that different people learn in different ways, they have different goals, they need different kinds of supports. Design learning works for some people but not others. Lecture works for some people but not others. There is no single solvent for learning. So. The major problem we have now is we have a very impoverished ecosystem with only a few possibilities. And rather than replace one impoverished ecosystem with a different impoverished ecosystem that has different possibilities, what we should be thinking about is broadening the range and then empowering students to navigate to the part that works best for them. <laughs> like in the, in the museum. Good things usually shouldn't uh, be changed if they are, uh, don't change a winning team. Uh, I think evolution is a better word than radical change. Mm -hmm. From my point of view, I had the best experience with personal teaching. I had the best teachers in school that make me study physics. I had the best teachers in university, two Nobel Prize winners. I could learn personally from them, never, never, ever through the internet. Mm -hmm. But. We are living in a different society now, and the, the opportunity that we reach more people on Earth, and we have a problem when it comes to uh, uh, higher education in poorer countries. And for these uh, uh, countries, it's, it's very, very good to have uh, digital education through the Internet, through all the modern media, but not for everybody and for mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. The best is eye to eye. When I see my students, my yeah. students want to talk directly with me. They want to grab my hand, look in my eyes, and trust me. 
Well, face and to face is as as uh, it's the best broadband as you as you can get. Yeah. And Sorry. if you ask about the museum, the uh, mm -hmm. museum is 112 years old now. Mm -hmm. We are undergoing now in the moment a major change, a major renovation, and we will include and do include already uh, digital uh, uh, opportunities. But at the end of the day, we need spaces where people can go and grab objects, sure. do sure. experiments, as we do for almost 500,000 kids a year. We have around 1.5 million visitors per year. 500,000 are under the age of 18. And what they like is to cycle this bicycle mm -hmm. who can directly transform the idea that energy has to be generated by mm -hmm. cycling a dynamo machine. Mm -hmm. If we then additionally explain it through an animation, then it's good. But the animation alone doesn't tell you anything. Sure. You have to feel it, you have to smell it, and you have to be right in the middle of the experiment. And the last sentence to it, uh, from my point of view, maker spaces and uh, repair cafes, the new movement, mm -hmm. uh, and I wrote a book about repair, the culture of repair, is a golden way to bring especially young people uh, at what we call ignition labs. When we have 3D printing labs when in the Deutsches Museum in Munich, uh, we, people line up already in the morning because mm -hmm. they want to understand Industry 4.0, and we need people capable of combining mechanical uh, skills with uh, di digital skills. But they also want to do the mechanics, and they want to feel it, and they want mm -hmm. to do it themselves. You mm -hmm. only understand what you have done yourself. That's our strategy. Yes, I'm tinkering with an old car, so I know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. OK, well, uh, that, that's, you want to add something? Yeah, maybe just a short notice. I agree with the left of the family. I have to make a quantify to the right one. Uh, we're dealing with human beings, and what you actually said, uh, some methods are good for some people and some not, and that's why I see the counterpoint. For me, I don't know about your projects in detail, but I don't believe in a golden way, and I think this is maybe a, also a danger of the digitalization process of MOOCs, that we mm -hmm. think about it as the new gold standard of edu higher education, whereas from my experience, like, especially like you said, there are some people learn like this, some people learn better online when they have their own time focus, when they can learn at night, when they can look up things beyond. Some people have to do it themselves, some people need to touch. And therefore, we like to think about more digitalization as a way of, as a method, as a technical method to share content, but also as a way of collaborating. And this is the point where I want to maybe make an additional point, uh, that we see the problem that higher education is provided by actors that are bound by regional uh, law structures. Mm -hmm. For example, we talk a lot to universities based in Berlin here, and they talk, so, yes, MOOCs are very interesting, digitalization very interesting, but we can't do it because the law in Berlin looks like this and this and this. And so they can't use, take advantage of all, the, of all the capacity we have in the world and of all the advantages we have, and therefore I hope for the future that digitalization will not lead us to a, to a world where everyone is learning just via MOOCs, but to a world where we can go beyond the regional boundaries of the law system, of the political ecosystem, and where universities can do what they already do in the field of research, like internationally cooperate and work together, and then give a variety of options, a variety of opinions, a variety of methods to their students. Mm -hmm. Want to add Can something? we yeah. com continue a little bit? And yeah. I'm thinking the last two examples here from, uh, from Jörg uh, Dreger and Ulrich Weinberg, I think very well illustrates, in a sense, not perhaps extreme, but you know, some, some variety to exactly what you're saying. Yeah. It's, uh, neither is the best. They all work in different contexts. You need some hands-on, physical, multi-sensual experiences to learn something, touch even the professor, perhaps. And you need, there's some wonderful ways to use the new technology to reach and do a lot of exciting collaborative work with, backed up by insights from big data analysis. But both, to me, seems to be means to an end, or, or there's a goal behind this, no matter what way. And to me, I, if, if you talked about uh, uh, the Humboldt University here and that kind of ideal, but I think you in, in German, German you have the same term as we have in Swedish. I'm, I'm sure you came up with it first, but it's allgemeine Bildung. Mm -hmm. And it's this wonderful term that in Swedish is Allmän Bildung. 
So it's about the same, which I think in America, you would call, already in the Anglo-Saxon world, you would refer to as a, a liberal education or a liberal mm -hmm. arts education. And to me, it's all about this T-shape of the, the ideal of being a T-shaped individual. You're, you're kind of specialist and you know a lot of competences in some areas, but you're also broad enough to be able to see a little bit more of the picture and to kind of move in between. And what concerns me a bit of some of this movement, much more competence testing and competence focus, is that you focus on that part only. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of the more of the professional education, which I have great respect for, but also, for me, higher education is also adding to this more liberal Allgemeine Bildung ideal, which actually mm -hmm. has its roots in ancient uh, Greece, etc. So there's something to educating citizens, to providing something for them to be valuable beyond just the, the vertical part of the T. And there, it seems to me, we can do it in various ways, as you say, the ecosystem. Right. We'll, so it's more... Well, we were, in the other panel, we were talking about uh, the ability of uh, well, critical thinking, yeah. uh, taking risks, being courageous, um, open-minded, mm. and how can you get that without reading novels, looking at artwork, mm. going to, to the theater. So that's this Allgemeinbildung, as you said, uh, which is, I would say, um, uh, I would say um, necessary for uh, all those skills we were talking about when we, when, uh, we addressed um, uh, digital uh, knowledge or digital uh, education. So would you agree to that? or? Am I too, in French they say angelisme, so is it too, uh, too beautiful? Well, I, I agree about the value of a liberal education, but I think the big puzzle that we have is massive learning. Mm. And I'm not using the term MOOCs because I'm not a big fan of MOOCs, which doesn't make me popular at Harvard. But I am a big fan of massive learning, which is what we need to help the world writ large. And in massive learning, if it's going to be inexpensive, you can't have expensive instructional supports. So sure, at Harvard, given what we charge people, we can give them a wonderful education. And it's not hard for each of us to get up and talk about how we can have a wonderful education if you just have enough resources. But the puzzle is that for something to be massive and to be inexpensive, you can't have a lot of experts involved because they are expensive. So that gets back to the peer learning that has come up in different flavors. And I think one of the things that's been neglected about massive learning is the opportunity to compose learning groups. So at Harvard I teach what are fairly large classes for Harvard, 60, 70 students, and I try to group students in ways that complement one another, different backgrounds, different life experiences, different uh, personal philosophies, but enough commonalities that they can talk to one another and that they can try to complement one another in their learning, to complement me. Um, but I'm limited in how I can group 60 students. If I have 100,000 students and I knew the right questions to ask them in advance, I could form the ideal learning group for every one of those 100,000 students with 99,000 plus other students as the pool from which to draw. Mm. So this whole issue, not just of how we collaborate, which I agree is, is an important problem. Uh, every parent knows that children are born curious, but children are not necessarily born collaborative. Um, but how we get beyond collaboration to complementarity in learning massive learning will depend on that more than cloning people like me. Um, that, I think, is the interesting challenge, how you take each one of these powerful small-scale methods and find a way to do it at scale. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's also, education is also challenged by the notion that uh, learning happens everywhere all the time. It's not only within educational institutions. Mm -hmm. And how do we respond to that? How do we incorporate that learning into school education? So it challenges the whole notion of education. It's not anymore about teaching. 
It's more about learning. And how do we then help the learner to learn his or her own way and, and help her to become what she can be? Mm -hmm. So uh, we have, in ESPO, we have thought about what is school. We used to build two to three new schools every year. And then at the same time, we had this problem of uh, schools being sick. We had the, the, um, the health problems because of the harsh weather we have and the way they had been built. So we had to find new ways of organizing schools or schooling. And now we, um, we are starting a project or a prototype called School as a Service. And actually, that's um, sort of come to, uh, it's after a long um, thought process of what's actually important. It's providing that service of helping you learn. And in our project, it also includes of um, sort of blowing up schools in a way. Um, we can't afford to build that many schools every year, so now we are teaming up with the University of Aalto, Aalto University, and they have some extra space, so we're having educational places within the Aalto campus. So we will use that space that's left over from the university and try out new way of organizing education. And at the same time, in this collaboration, it challenges the university teaching as well. I, I think it's, uh, there's a lot of things happening in a lot of places. And uh, I think we're all in the, the whole sector expanded, experimenting a lot. But uh, as uh, Chris said, people like him and uh, the rest of us are very expensive here. So I'm currently involved in an experiment which I find is kind of interesting, and that is, uh, makes me be considered as a radical, uh, dangerous radical. But it is to try to see if we can make professors obsolete. Uh, in the teaching mm -hmm. uh, by, uh, by actually gamification. So it's another one of those experiments. We've actually involved in a, in, a, in a very simple yet very powerful game to teach strategy. I'm a professor of strategy. So it's, it's actually a, a game that allows students to go in alone or in groups and play for a little while. Very simple, walk into a, a lounge like this and talk to people and gather information, then answer questions and then go forward. And we, we did a first experiment a couple of weeks ago with people who only did the game, people who got the literature by reading books and articles, and then a superstar professor coming in and teaching them, sort of in separate groups. And then they all, had, uh, they all did a case study, the same case study as a test. And then we graded it, with three of us grading it, tried to, to, to do it similar. Preliminary finding is that the best student do well in any, anything, in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, but the folks that did the gaming only, there seems to be less variation. So the bell curve is, mm -hmm. is shrunk, which is interesting because that means that that tail here, the bad tail, so to say, less performative, is not so big. So these are just early preliminary findings, but I find it extraordinarily interesting. And this is not big data, this is small data, but just the first test mm -hmm. to see. And of course, this scared the professor quite a mm -hmm. lot, <laughs> the star professor, because, my God, you know, how, how useful am I, in a sense? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things happening. I think it's very, very exciting and mm -hmm. in the ecosystem, so to say. Yeah. So to say. And, and building on this idea of life-wide learning, where you're not just learning at the school place and the school mm -hmm. time, but you're learning throughout your life, mm -hmm. A lot of that um, requires a kind of inversion. So much of what we do in universities is we teach just in case. Just in case you encounter this in the real world sometime, here's how you handle it. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, people forget. They're not very good at transfer. <laughs> They're learning things that have no applicability to what they want to do. Just in case doesn't work very well. Uh, if you're only out learning in life, if, if you just say, well, we don't really need education now because people can just learn from each other and learn in life, you're trying to reinvent civilization mm -hmm. uh, within the span of your years of learning, and that doesn't work very well either. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting, I think, is an interweaving of formal and informal that's just in time. Mm -hmm. 
So you start with a, a real problem, like the design learning, out sometimes in the real world, not even an academic problem that's posed. But very quickly, you run up against the limits of your knowledge and your strategies. And so that's when the just-in-time comes in with getting some of the knowledge of civilization, the content and the skills. Now, that's a complicated model in terms of footwork and timing. But I think in the long run, it's going to be what actually works for us with massive learning. Mm -hmm. This brings me to a practical example. Um, my grandson uh, just entered a school where he's got uh, two hours per week uh, in robotics. So what do they do in robotics? They do mathematics, they do physics, uh, classical uh, mechanics, they do uh, electronics, they, they do computer science, they do man-machine interaction and ethics. So all these topics are within a, uh, along a practical project. And I would say uh, the old method of um, compartmentalization of all of our knowledge, uh, well, it, it might be necessary, in the, uh, still necessary, but um, with those with projects like, like those, you can get um, up-to-date, hands-on uh, digital knowledge, um, uh, which remains, and uh, what remains as well is uh, the ability of um, problem solving. Mm. So might it be that in, in our schools we have uh, an obsolete, an obsolete uh, idea of, uh, of topics to learn? I don't know for all people here on the panel, but at least in the German school system it's changing. You know? It's this whole shift from content to competence, mm -hmm. which is exactly uh, covering that what you mentioned, like critical thinking, problem solving. And what I feel is that there's a lot of, you mentioned earlier that there's a lot of reforming going on in the school sector and the education sector at all at, in the universities. And but, but what we have seen in the past, if exactly, let's go to the to the market side, if, the, if there's a revolution on the, on the technical or digital age or whatever, there's always new actors rising. And I think what ha didn't happen yet is actors for the informal part of education, mm -hmm. like partners of schools or partners of universities. We have partner companies, yes, we have. But I think there need to be new actors and new institutions to deliver that part because Honestly, I see that the universe are very interested in the topic, but just from the German perspective, for example, the professors are very much covered in bureaucratic, in administration, in just being present at the class, handling their staff, doing research. So I don't see the capacity where they should go out, try out something new. Maybe there are some singleized professors who are really presented here as good examples and interesting projects and nice experiments, but on larger scale, like in, if you really go to all the universities, to the ground. The professors don't have time for this, and they don't have the competence, and they don't have the time to learn it, and that's maybe why mm -hmm. they also don't have the motivation mm -hmm. to do it, because also how we build our ecosystem at the universities, mm -hmm. it's different from country to country, you can't generalize, but at least in Germany you have a people on the top who are quite long there, the professors, and you have a very large staff that is changing a lot, like PhD students are expected to change the institution, that means they stay two or three years at the institution, they change for postdoc and again, so they have no, how, how should be their motivation to develop an institution further, to take it to the next level. And if you want to have not radical change, but evolutionary change, you have, it has to be step by step. And you have to, there need to be people behind to actually do this and make it together with the universities. And that's what I believe we will see in the future, that with edX and with diversity, for example, here in Berlin, it's maybe the first steps, like first actors that are mm -hmm. emerged from the universities. I think what will be the future is like uh, partners that are in non-profit, that are educational institutions, but not universities. Mm. Concerning uh, what's happening in the classroom, I have uh, a layman's question. How important would it be, how important is it to learn to code in school. Is it important? Very important. <laughs> Sorry. Why? <laughs> what does it give? I every, mean, you, you, every, you, you learn... <laughs> well, I, I learned to code, but, uh, <laughs> but it was Fortran. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, w w when, when you learn a, a, a programming language of today, which is obsolete in 10 years, so what does it give? 
there is the, well, no, go ahead. There is this movement, uh, this uh, action in Germany, start coding, which has been uh, mm -hmm. created by Ranga Yogeshwar and others. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea is uh, uh, to involve, uh, uh, especially, of course, pupils, young people, in projects rather than in uh, formal learning in school. Because formal learning in school can mean that the teacher writes something on the table mm -hmm. uh, and uh, people go home and say, well, forget it, it's not relevant for me. But if you do projects like Start Coding, which involves, for instance, uh, I do coding because I want to create new type of music. Mm -hmm. I'm a musician. I want to become a musician mm -hmm. in my life. Or I want to do a certain type of art, new ways of painting. And for that, there's a program I can do. I can be uh, involved when I understand coding. Mm. So there must be mm -hmm. an aim for me, not yeah. the subject by itself is the point, but why should I do it? And if you can uh, answer this question, and I think this holds for every subject, mm. uh, if you want to have to learn calculus and you only uh, see somebody standing in front of you and telling you how uh, infinitesimal calculus works, you always ask yourself the question, what should it be good for? I will become a polit politician in my life anyway. I don't need mathematics. But at the end of the day, you may find out that any political decision is based on natural science and mathematics and coding, maybe. So every discipline has a kind of thinking associated with it. Mm -hmm. uh, I work in science education, so I attempt to teach students inquiry, which is not just in science, historical inquiry is actually rather similar. It's a way of making meaning out of complexity by looking for evidence and doing experiments. Um, people believe that there is something called computational thinking that is mm -hmm. the superstructure where coding is just the example. Um, there still are debates about to what extent there is computational thinking and what would be involved in it. For example, recursion is a fundamental idea in computer science. I'm not mm -hmm. going to try to explain it here, but it, it's something that you don't learn in any other field, so it's, except mathematics, so it is something that might be unique to learning to code. So I think we always have to ask ourselves, especially as you say, I learned Fortran too, and, and I don't use Fortran now, but I do use aspects of the computational thinking that mm -hmm. I've learned. So we always have to ask, what's, be what's behind the specifics of what we're teaching to the underlying generality, which is back to the liberal education. In a sense, mm -hmm. the liberal education is in part understanding inquiry understanding mm -hmm. computational thinking, understanding mathematical thinking, even if you aren't in those fields, so mm -hmm. you can interact with people in those mm -hmm. fields. Well, that's exactly, exactly the point I wanted to, to, um, to reach, because uh, if you do calculus, it changes your mindset. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would agree, if you once learn to program, uh, it changes your, your mindset. It even shows in the, uh, in the counterculture or subculture of the hackers. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, there is a debate in, uh, uh, business, in the business school sector, has been for quite some time, and it's a rather self-critical uh, sector actually, but there is an ongoing discussion now, which I appreciate a lot, uh, that business schools should care more for engineering students. Mm -hmm. Now, I, as much as I agree with that, I like to turn it around, and <laughs> I'm actually just writing a piece for an industry magazine on it, uh, that in fact business school students, as examples of sort of social science uh, people, should speak more of the language of the natural sciences. Just you have to be kind of STEM, as it's called, science, technology, engineering, math. You have to be, STEM, be skilled in the vocabulary, perhaps in the syntax of STEM, so that you can communicate. Whether coding is part of that, well, maybe as part of it, maybe code, coding. I, I learned a bit of Fortran, a bit of Pascal, and some stuff, totally useless today. But uh, it's perhaps like a language also. I mm -hmm. tend to tell young kids, it's a language. You want to learn German, mm -hmm. French, or Spanish, learn uh, C++. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's kind of a way to communicate and interact also. So. 
there's been a big debate or a discussion in Finland about this because next year we will have a new national curriculum in general education mm. and it includes coding mm. for everyone Perfect. in basic education. Perfect. So one of the arguments has been that it's, it's a language. Mm. You ought to know coding. You need it in everything because it, it brings you to understand something of the, or enough of the digital world because it's everywhere around you. And if you learn a foreign language, it changes your mindset as well. Yes. yes. When I lived in France and I uh, learned to speak more or less fluently French, uh, I discovered my own Frenchness. And the same thing happens to you when you code, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, is there also something as well, something unconscious, if you dwell into the realms of coding, computer science, is there, like uh, with engineers, who have an en engineering, engineering approach, so does this exist as well in computer science? Would you say that? I would maybe like to add that I don't disagree that coding is just a language, because a language is basically a way to express yourself, and coding definitely is, but it, uh, it look, it, it gives the impression that it's just about learning the words and you can use it. Uh, but I mean, coding is more, of, it's combining two things. It's combining a very rational thing, like mathematics and one and zeros, you know. Uh, but it's also combining creativity because you can actually develop something yeah. completely new that yeah. hasn't been there before. Yeah. Mm. What you can't do for language, you can use the words, you can maybe, yeah. maybe the languages are developing over time or what so on, and you can use them in a different way. But it's basically you're using a system that is already there, and you mm. do the same with coding. You use a system that is already there, but you develop something that hasn't been there before, and this is the interesting part. And I think this is what makes uh, coding so special and so important, and like you said, it's a new way of thinking because mm -hmm. you think in the creative, you find creative solutions for a certain problem. So it's not only useful, it's more than that. It's more than that, yeah. Mm -hmm. chain, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's chain, we agree on the results, but I think the, the reason behind it is maybe mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. At this point, I would like to allow for questions or remarks of, uh, of uh, the floor, please. Yeah. So, over there, this gentleman over there. I would like to share an experience about uh, um, ex replacing teachers or professors or good professors, as has been said. We tried that, and we tried that by using the method that uh, Chris did said, namely using a case study from the Harvard Business School, going th once to the case study, come back, teach theory and so on, and we did a digital system for that, and the, the uh, results are not very promising in terms of replacing good professors. Maybe replacing bad professors, but not replacing good professors. I can talk about that later, but there's a limit to that. And the other thing that I would like to recommend, please stop up talking about coding and about programming. Tell the young people, or all other people, that they have a method of uh, instructing systems to do something, not coding. When you have a programmable machine, then you should tell them that the power that they have is to tell to this machine, which is an automaton, uh, what to do for them. You don't invent always new things with programming, especially if you are not interested in doing real programming. Thank you. Other remarks? Yes. My name is Hoboom. I'm professor for library information science at the Potsdam University of Applied Science. And I have mainly a question for Ms. Kekule and the panel, of course, too. Uh, we were talking about uh, the third place as a place for learning. And I know, especially uh, for Finland, uh, libraries have a very great impact when it comes to the OECD indicators uh, in education. Here in Germany, we are talking uh, since uh, 10 years or so about our PISA shock, which is the educational reform uh, we are missing since at least 10 years and which uh, we are talking about here. So uh, I know that, uh, especially in Helsinki, there was a very big... Uh, uh, experience, a good experience with the Helsinki Public Library 
and I know that ESPO also is, uh, has a quite uh, good library. So uh, you, we know also that uh, there are a lot of uh, big cities in the world which uh, try to do their city and municipal development together with the municipal library, like for instance Birmingham or uh, recent weeks uh, in Aarhus. And I was wondering uh, that you, uh, during the talk at the panel, you're only addressing the formal education, like school education. But I think more important is the informal education, where the libraries do fit in as a third place, the vibrant and dynamic place, which they are more and more, uh, as the third place for learning and uh, creation of knowledge. Could you please elaborate on this? Do, uh, did uh, Finland, or especially ESPO, uh, quit this strategy? Okay. Well, I'm glad you brought the libraries as a learning hubs up because it's very important in Finland. Uh, we take the kids early on already in the kindergarten age to libraries and we teach them how libraries function and that they are welcome to come there and it's a place for learning. And today libraries aren't anymore um, uh, places to store books. They are very active places to sort of um, attract all kinds of people. And um, it's very um, incremental in school education, but also in lifelong learning. Because, for example, in ESPO we have um, uh, these um, how do you, maker spaces in library where you can come and and uh, learn something, or you can teach some other people to learn something. So it's an exchange place of learning or, and teaching, in a way. And uh, they are also um, sort of our shared living rooms, because in Finland uh, we have libraries in every... Well, we have bigger libraries, but then also very local libraries where you can uh, get books, but you can get also like sewing machines or skis or skates or things, but also you can learn how to use your iPad or how to how to sew the things that you need to sew or or learn new things. So it, they are very crucial in in education as well, and it's a free space for also different generations to learn together. So it sort of supports the formal system of education mm -hmm. in many ways. You want to add? And of course, as you said, museums are the as places well. for informal learning. Yeah. Since together with my, I can tell you, with my colleagues from the seven largest European science museums, we represent around 35 million visitors per year. And these 35 million visitors per year in Paris, in uh, Milano, in uh, Munich and so on, uh, they come for informal learning, and they use, for instance, in the Deutsches Museum, our library, which is one of the largest uh, science technical libraries uh, uh, in, in Europe, at least. Uh, but we undergo also this process now of renovation, and we put around 10 million euro in uh, the digitization projects uh, linked to our library and to our archives. Since uh, we have many, many uh, uh, books, uh, hundred, uh, about, about a million, which are not fully digitized yet, and it's a huge project, uh, as well as it is a project, for instance, we are one of the first uh, technical museums in Europe to be part of uh, Google's uh, uh, project, uh, the Google Cultural Institute. Since we <coughs> believe in two things, it's important that people come and read in a library and exchange ideas in a museum and see and do and smell and, as I said before. But on the other hand, there are many, many people on Earth who are never, ever able to visit our museums mm -hmm. just from uh, economical mm -hmm. reasons. And for these people and for the education <laughs> of all kids on Earth, we have to do uh, to share our uh, our libraries as well as our objects with everybody on earth. And this is, I think, the uh, ethical uh, uh, task we have as a uh, developed society. And therefore, uh, the digital uh, movement uh, helps a, a great deal. 
in uh, becoming ethical, uh, relevant on mm -hmm. Earth as museums, as universities. I also represent the Technical University of Munich, uh, and we do collaborate uh, with uh, many, many, many initiatives who have uh, the, uh, the goal to broaden education from the formal part, which I would say is absolutely necessary, but also to the informal part. And remember that museums are usually in the middle of society when it comes to the question, where are they? <coughs> what places are they? They are usually in the middle of cities and they have low level entrance fees. Mm. So many people, and we believe that all uh, uh, skills are equally distributed uh, within society. Many people with lower income uh, can uh, enter educational realms if they enter museums. And therefore we believe that uh, places to share uh, education will be even more important in the future than they have been before. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now it's the last two questions from the, f from the floor. You start. Yeah. Yes, I have, uh, I have one question. Um, oh, no, 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 this gentleman over here, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah well, he was first. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> Formalized. I know it's arbitrary. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm so sorry. Um, I'm enjoying it. Ask a question. Uh, Philip Hellerman from the International University of Batonev. And I'm somewhat confused. Um, that there, there, there is an essential issue that I have that doesn't pop up at all. And that is, we were hearing a lot about systems that can, well, basically advise students what to learn, which program to choose. We've got systems that tell students what the next course is. We've got systems that tell students when and how to learn content. And in the end, we've got highly qualified students in uh, some competencies, but it seems to me that we are starting to um, blend out that there are other competencies, like self-organizational uh, um, competencies, uh, the competency to identify what you really want and how you've got to achieve it, if we are trusting too much uh, in these assistance systems. I mean, after all, uh, even if we start replacing professors with educational games, there's only the content that is in the software that remains relevant. There's no adverse views. There's no objections coming from people. There's no discussion going on in that case. I mean, we're, we're definitely achieving higher efficiency. And we've got standardized testing. We've got standardized curriculums. We've got standardized results in the end. But what are the people then in the end that we have? Are they free thinkers? Do they have personal freedom? Do they have a personal choice, really? Or is it something mm -hmm. that, if we put it to the extreme, there's a person at the very beginning, and there is a target at the very end, and we just put them through the machine and the software, and there he goes without any choice. Mm -hmm. And do you have got a question? Yeah. OK. The gentleman over there wanted. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have one question. For me, education is still very, very much a people business. It has a lot to do with really um, yeah, getting the right connection um, to, the, um, to the children and also at the university. Um, I think that we have discussed a lot about that this is a society that everything is changing very, very fast. But I wonder a little bit that we are not really talking about the teachers, because I think also the teachers have to learn a lot, or the professors, and how to make sure that they can also yeah, have the same speed of change, that they are really um, yeah, going the same speed as the whole society and can really bring what they have to deliver to the children and, yeah, what do you think about that? Mm -hmm. And the last question, and then we... Yeah, last question. Answer, um, try to. Uh, Elmar Hasman. So we, from ELIC, we have organized um, a small panel discussion uh, in uh, the last year at a coder school in Paris called Ecole 42. 
Um, the 42 comes from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And the, the school has many of the characteristics that you've been talking about, like um, uh, it has no formal professors, so it's peer-based learning, it's learning in projects, uh, it has no formal entrance requirement, but the school basically chooses um, which um, students they want to take, and it has an incredible track record in bringing students into an employment. But the thing that has really um, convinced me the most was when I heard that 50% of the students were actually former dropouts of the regular university system. So 50% of the coder students that they had were students that actually were frustrated in the previous system and they dropped out of their studies. So I wanted to um, ask the question, how do you think about, so what's the current you're feeling about how many talents or students actually we don't reach with the traditional system and what can new models or also new surpluses or the change to that situation? So, who wants to answer? Well, I'll, I'll just say a couple quick things in response. First, I'm, I'm not arguing that, that we should get rid of professors and, and replace them with some kind of machine. You know, I've eaten very well, really too well, here in Berlin. Wonderful restaurants with great chefs. And, and that's a very high quality experience. Um, but I don't know any way that every person in the world can eat at those restaurants every day. And there are people in the world who are literally starving. So when we take that analogy for learning, Yes, we do want to have some very high-end learning environments for people who can afford them, and we need to try to drive economics in such a way that more and more people can afford them. But we also need, instead of just saying, well, it's the steakhouse or nothing, to say, no, we, we need some ways of massive learning that may not be as good, but that are helping people who are just starving mm -hmm. for knowledge. The, the other thing that I would say is that I'm also nervous about the recommendation systems for a different reason. Um, I have a son who would rather be a not very good musician than a really good biologist. Um, that should be a choice. Uh, the choice to do something that you love rather than the thing that you're best at is one of the things that I think students always wrestle with. And I don't want to automatically steer them into what they're best at, other than giving them the information that they need to make their own decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, seconding what you're saying, Chris, I think it's very, very well put, a good analogy um, from a steakhouse <laughs> to nothing. Um, same thing. Uh, two books that I think should be recommended reading for everybody uh, in the spirit of a liberal education or an allgemeine Bildung. And the first one is uh, uh, Aldous Huxley's A Brain New World, uh, written in the 30s, I believe. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of a, an interesting story. But read that and think about some of the artificial intelligence-based society we're moving towards, including some of those recommendations of what you should be doing, because I can predict based on your whatever record. Mm -hmm. Just give that a think. The second book is a, a little bit of a tougher read, and that's... Uh, uh, 2,300 years old, and that's the Nicomachean Ethics by uh, Aristotle, in which he's, he is outlining, in a sense, the attributes of good leadership, to put it mildly. Uh, and that is to lead, at that state, a city-state, uh, which could perhaps be analogous to the regions we see now, the 300-plus regions in Europe. You need to know uh, about how the natural world, how the, the, the laws of the natural world, all right, epistemic. Right? But that's not enough to lead others. You must also be pretty smart, cunning, you could say, metis in Greek. But that's not enough either, because that's just what general lawyers and politicians do. To be a true leader, you have to go beyond that and really have what they call the good eye to see what is good beyond your egoism, to see what's good for the community that you're a part of. 
that sustains yourself. And that was called phronesis. And that, I think, is a really good read to comprehend that it's beyond mm -hmm. everything we talk about. It is the T. It is specialist and knowing this stuff, but it's also knowing a little bit of everything so that you can make your own decisions about what's good, not only for you, but also for the community around you. Mm -hmm. So that would be my little... Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. At this point, I hate to end this panel, but I have to. And, uh, Sorry about it. Thank, no, I thank all the participants and, and the floor as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.